outcomes, and that includes surgery, of course, but also in, in most commonly non-operative subspecialties such as pain management, rehabilitation medicine, radiology for diagnosis. Uh, we have neurology on board here in the spine center, but we also work with, for example, with integrative health, with chiropractors, with uh, acupuncturists, uh, not necessarily here in the spine center, but we have a close collaboration because a lot, a lot of what our patients suffer from are things that require sometimes a more comprehensive approach in terms of diagnosis, but certainly then also in treatment and in, in, um, in rehabilitation. And that's what we're all about. And lumbar spinal stenosis is a very, very common problem that we see in our patients. Now, I wanna introduce the two speakers that we have here tonight. On the left side, we'll have Dr. Vincent uh, Michio, who is an assistant professor of clinical rehabilitation medicine at Weill Cornell, and Dr. Daniel Pack, who is an assistant professor of pain management and anesthesiology at Weill Cornell. Now we all practice together here at the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. Many of you uh, know these two excellent uh, doctors, of course. And uh, we wanted to talk today about lumbar spinal stenosis, which, which again is a very, very common problem that we see in many of our patients. There are a million things to talk about. Where are we going to start? <laughs> so uh, I think, and, and I want to encourage all of you, again, there's a chat box. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, use the chat box. We'll try to get through as many comments as possible. I know that that is not always possible, but we'll try our best, of course. So maybe we'll get started with the anatomy and what lumbar spinal stenosis really entails. So maybe Dr. Mitchell, if you, if you don't mind, why don't you walk us through lumbar spinal stenosis a little bit? Good evening, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be here um, uh, to talk about this uh, very common um, uh, issue that many patients have. Um, so, you know, when we talk about lumbar stenosis, first, we should kind of orient ourselves a little bit. There's the, the cervical area, the thoracic area, the lumbar area, and the, the sacral area. And if you advance a slide one more, um, this is the area that we're talking about today, which is the lumbar spine there. So when we talk about lumbar stenosis, we're talking about narrowing around the nerves. That's what stenosis is. It's, it's about um, narrowing around the nerves of the central canal, which uh, Dr. Hartle is pointing to right, uh, uh, right there, right in the center area there. Um, and so if we look at the spine from the side, this is what spinal stenosis looks like. Um, all of our nerves, they start up in our brain and they travel downwards towards, you know, all the way to the tips of our toes. And um, the nerves traverse through this, essentially like a tube uh, um, within the spine. Um, and that, that's called the central canal. When that central canal becomes narrowed, that's when people develop symptomatic uh, lumbar stenosis and as depicted here. Um, and so tonight we're gonna be talking about uh, what lumbar stenosis is, how we diagnose it, um, um, the, how we navigate the differential diagnosis and the, the workup of it. We're gonna also gonna touch on various types of treatment options from non-operative uh, types of treatment to um, interventional treatments. Um, interventional is another word for uh, treatment with various types of injections and things like that. Uh, we're also going to touch on prevention, uh, how we can uh, maintain spine health um, uh, and prevent uh, uh, deterioration, um, and uh, touch on various aspects of, of these treatments, including some complications that may arise. Yeah, doctor, uh, let me, yeah, good. So, you know, one of the, you know, obviously we start with the patient first, um, and, um, you know, a, a, one of our most powerful diagnostic tools is that conversation that we have with the patient and the physical exam that we do with the patient. Um, but another very uh, powerful tool that we have is the MRI. Um, and uh, because the MRI gives us a uh, very detailed picture of the spinal canal and of the, um, the vertebra and the discs. So on the image on the left-hand side there, what we're looking at is a lumbar spine from the side. Um, the left-hand side of the screen is the front of the body. 
the right hand side of the screen is the back of the body. And um, uh, just behind where the vertebrae and the discs are, uh, the, the discs, the, the vertebrae are those kind of rectangular uh, structures and the discs are the black structures there. Right behind there, we see the central canal. It's a little bit hard to make out, but you can see these kind of wispy gray structures moving through, um, through the central canal. And you can see where there's areas um, where there's uh, some narrowing. If you look at the three images on the right-hand side, the image on the top, there is some mild to moderate narrowing, but we can still see um, a patent central canal there. In fact, you can see some little gray dots in there. Those are actually the nerves um, sliced crosswise. Um, uh, and in between there, you see some white. And that white is the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and the, the nerves are, are kind of floating in there. As you go to the middle uh, picture there, we see an example of spinal stenosis. This is where there has been narrowing of that central canal such that um, all of the nerves there have been, have been compressed uh, like, like so. If you then go down to the level below that, we see that that central canal opens up again. You see those little gray dots, which are the nerves floating in that white, uh, white stuff there, which is the cerebral spinal fluid. So this, this slide is an excellent example of on the top, fairly normal looking central canal in the middle. That is a classically stenotic appearance of the central canal. And at the bottom there, we see it uh, open up again. Dr. Mitchell, can I, uh, uh, no, we, we already, we're getting a lot of questions and comments, which is great. But one question, especially that, that, that I think goes along with this slide is, you know, the, the genetic predisposition. This, this looks pretty dramatic. If you look at the, as you pointed out down here, there's a lot of spinal fluid and there's a lot of room. And then here it's very, very tight. And, and you know, I can certainly observe in my patient, the patients that I see, sometimes you see the grandfather, the father, the children, yeah. they all have spine issues, unfortunately. What, 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 what do we know about uh, you know, genetic predisposition? Does it run in families? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, often I, I have this conversation with my patients saying that, you know, this is nature and nurture. It, it's, it's both. Um, and when we talk about types of uh, spinal stenosis, we generally categorize them into um, uh, congenital spinal stenosis. That is spinal stenosis that you are sort of born with to a certain extent. And then there's more acquired spinal stenosis, which is from degenerative changes that happen um, uh, you know, as we live our lives. The reality is, is that it's a bit of both in, in all of us. Um, some of us are born with naturally more narrow canals than others, and other people have more open canals. And that, that does um, affect one's um, predisposition to develop uh, lumbar stenosis, definitely. Do, 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 there's another question, and that's also something that comes up all the time. How do we, what, does it have, what, what does this have to do, if anything, with arthritis? Mm, sure. You know, arthritis is a general term that is used to denote um, uh, degenerative and to a certain extent inflammatory changes of bone. And, 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 um, and those changes happen in our joints, uh, but they also happen to the bones of the spine. And so um, when it comes to arthritis of the spine, what we're talking about is an overall degenerative change that is um, sort of a fancy word for wear and tear of the body um, that eventually leads to processes where, for instance, when we're born, our bones are nice and smooth. Uh, as we age, those smooth bones become a bit more jagged. We get more bone spurring. The ligaments become a bit more lax. And that eventually leads to um, previously open areas becoming more narrowed and such. And you know that's, a, that's sort of an oversimplification of things. Um, some folks have more systemic arthritic problems that certainly can affect the spine as well as other, other joints. But the majority of people have osteoarthritis and osteoarthritis affects the joints, it affects the bones, but it can lead to the, this sort of picture of lumbar stenosis as well. And sometimes the CT scan can show that, right? We have a CT myelogram here. Yeah, and you know, there's different tools that we have in our toolbox here. Um, we have uh, plain x-rays, which actually can be somewhat helpful for 
the general diagnosis of arthritis in the back. We have MRIs that show us very detailed pictures of the soft tissue and such. And then we have um, CT scans, which give us very detailed images of the bones. And then we have a CT myelogram, which is um, a CT scan with an introduction of contrast into the uh, spinal canal. And when that contrast shows up, um, when, when we see that contrast from the CT, it shows up as bright. So we can see when things are open, we can see when things are closed off or stenosed. That, that can be a helpful uh, uh, tool that we use. We often use that in patients who have had spine surgery uh, or have you know, hardware in place that would otherwise um, cause artifact on some of the other imaging modalities such as MRI and, and to a certain extent CT. Well, thank, you know, Dr. Mitchell, thanks for kind of getting us started with lumbar stenosis. There are questions about posture and, and how do you differentiate yeah. lumbar stenosis from vascular? Those are all great, great questions and we'll get to those, but maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the clinical presentation, patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, when we see them in the office, what, you know, what, how, do, how do we know that what they present with is consistent with, or what are the typical symptoms, signs and symptoms of lumbar spinal stenosis? Uh, maybe Dr. Pack, if you wanna walk us through that, and uh, a lot of it is listed here, but maybe you, you tell us a little bit more about the presentation. Sure, happy to. Um... So I think Dr. Michio did a great job of just kind of explaining the underlying pathology of what it looks like on imaging. Now, in terms of presentation, certainly there's some variability there. Um, what you can see, what we see most often though in the clinic is, is kind of listed on the slide that Dr. Hartle just showed us. So uh, certainly some patients may have a component of back pain, although that's not necessarily everybody. So you may or may not have back pain. Oftentimes, a very common complaint that patients will say is that they have pain that radiates down the legs. Now, the characteristic of this can differ from patient to patient. Oftentimes, it's, des it's described as a burning sensation. Some people will say pins and needles. Oftentimes, it'll radiate from the low back or the buttock area all the way into the calves. Um, in cases where the stenosis is, let's say, particularly severe, then some patients may have a component of weakness um, as well as certainly a decreased endurance for physical activity. So that is just because oftentimes patients have decreased exercise tolerance as a result of their pain. Now, one thing that we will always ask patients with spinal stenosis or suspected spinal stenosis is what type of positions make them feel better. So one thing I will ask my patients is, well, does walk, how many blocks can you walk? Right. And most patients will tell me, well, look, I can only walk maybe a couple blocks or so before I have to stop. Now, one key oftentimes defining characteristic of symptomatic spinal stenosis um, is that patients oftentimes will say that they get relief when they bend forward or in a forward posture. And what you can see in that picture uh, is a person with a shopping cart. And so we'll also oftentimes call this shopping cart sign. So if you're at your grocery store and you're seeing a lot of elderly folks leaning forward, leaning on their shopping cart, Maybe they're just doing that because they're tired for other reasons, but oftentimes it's because they have spinal stenosis. And the reason for that is because when you're bending forward, you're actually inadvertently, without intentionally doing so maybe, you're actually creating space in that spine. So that oftentimes will relieve pressure off those nerves that Dr. Mitchell was mentioning. Many patients will oftentimes say as a result that they get relief when they sit. So those two characteristics tend to be pretty hallmark for spinal stenosis. They'll tell you they can sit all day, but they can only walk a block. You know, uh, sometimes we see patients, uh, Dr. Peck, who, you know, they can't walk, but they, they can be on the bike forever. They can do it. Now, I, I saw a patient the other day, couldn't walk 10 steps without pain, but then on the stationary bike at night, he's on the bike for an hour without problems. What, why is that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's for the reasons that we just pointed out, right? If you're, if you're on a bike, you're in a sitting position, right? So that's, that's a very good point. I, I had a patient a couple of weeks ago say the same thing. He said, I could ride my, my Peloton all day, but I can't walk. And when I hear something like that, um, then oftentimes the first thing I think of is, is spinal stenosis. No, and and sometimes, I, sometimes it's just the lack of blood. Sometimes the blood vessels can be bad, right? You don't have enough blood supply to the legs. And, and that in those patients, they can actually, they can't be on the bike. So that, you know, somebody was asking before, 
you know, what, what are vascular reasons for, for, for that type of pain? Sometimes patients who have totally fine lumbar anatomy, no lumbar spinal stenosis, but they have blocked blood vessels like heavy smokers, they can have, they, they can have the same type of back and leg pain, uh, but it's called by the vessel occlusion and they, can, they cannot be on the bike. They, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to get on the bike and bike for an hour. So that's how you, as a, as a physician, that's how you can, can differentiate one from the other and then obviously do more testing. Uh, so um, uh, so yeah, thanks Dr. Pack. And then here, what, what's, what does this show? So, yeah, I mean, what you're seeing here actually is just uh, anatomically what is going on here, right? So um, as we pointed out, you know, patients will say standing is really bad. Uh, extended walking is really difficult. And what you can see there on the spine is when you're in that standing up position, you're actually extending your back, which actually makes the stenosis or really uh, accentuates that stenotic segment. So you can see there uh, that that nerve root is, is really, uh, really tight and that space in the central canal is also tight. When you're sitting, now you're in that kind of forward flexion position again, you're actually creating space, right? So that's what you're seeing um, kind of pictorially on that element, on that particular region of the spine. Yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to say a few words about the workup as, as you know, Dr. Peck and Dr. Michio, you know, we, we work physically together in the spine center. I know that you guys also, are, you know, I know Dr. Michio is at, is at the Methodist Hospital, right? And you have like a mini spine center there and um, uh, and Dr. Pack, are you are you just here at the spine center, or where, where else do you see patients? Yeah, so we we actually also have a spine center uh, with some of your other spine colleagues over at, at Lower Manhattan Hospital. So on one fifty six. Yeah, that's Williams. great. So, but the idea is always for us to combine, as as I mentioned in the beginning, not only a surgeon, but but always have non operative medicine there because we just need. For proper diagnosis and management, you just need the whole package. You can't do everything by yourself because, you know, I wouldn't be able to work a lot of these patients up. And I, I have a, I have an example here on the left side. I wanted to show that because it shows nicely how patients have e spine issues that can be fairly complicated to really diagnose. This patient on the left side, yeah, he had lumbar spinal stenosis, and you can see here he had a fusion done. That's an X-ray of the lumbar spine. And he came in with right side and back and leg pain. And everybody thought that, that this was from stenosis, a foraminal stenosis, compression of the nerve root. And then when I saw him in the office earlier today, and this is actually, he himself is a pain management doctor who's retired now. Uh, but it was very interesting because the MRIs can show lumbar stenosis or foraminal stenosis, but the pain that he had just didn't fit because you know he was actually uh, he had pain at night uh, when he was moving his leg and when he was sitting, which usually with lumbar stenosis doesn't happen. So if I was just by myself as a surgeon somewhere, I would have I would have a very hard time really taking it from there. I would have to send the patient somewhere else, maybe, and then it takes weeks to get an appointment with any of the other doctors. So, but what I did here is I talked to Ricky Singh, who's who was seeing patients today with me, and the suspicion was that maybe he had a hip problem. And uh, Dr. Singh, he did an injection into the hip. His pain was totally gone immediately. So now we got to see obviously how long that lasts, but at least we have a diagnosis. So, so that's the beauty of really having a spine group, a, sp a multidisciplinary spine center that you can see patients, you can you know, test your, your hypothesis if you have a certain uh, proposed diagnosis and you can actually prove it right then and there and therefore, you know, speed up the whole process for the patient and for everybody to you know, get a good proper diagnosis and then hopefully the right treatment. And this is another patient I saw today. This is a uh, internist actually, she came from Buffalo and she has lumbar stenosis uh, and it's not terrible, but the lumbar stenosis is really not that bad. But she, what she also had was, you can see that little bright spot. She had a synovial cyst there. And uh, so the problem was not really the lumbar stenosis, it was really more the cyst. And then again, I worked, you know, Ricky was here today, Ricky Singh. So he aspirated that cyst and she was pain-free afterwards and uh, it's going back to Buffalo tonight. So again, those are all examples of really how you lever something that we have here, the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach to work up patients and really come up with a proper diagnosis because it's not always as easy as, 
as we indicated, it's not always just looking at the MRI scan. Not everybody has the classical symptoms of lumbar stenosis. Sometimes it, it can be quite confusing and that's exactly where it's so helpful to have other specialists who are very smart and, and really are uh, great diagnosticians and also eventually for the treatment, very helpful. Uh, but you've got to sometimes talk to your colleagues and, and take advantage of what they do as well. But now let's talk about uh, the treatment. And obviously the biggest portion here is non-operative. Uh, I think Dr. Mitchell, right? Are you going to, did you want to say a few words? Uh, yeah. So, um, this here is um, an article that is hot off the presses. This is uh, from uh, September of uh, 2021, published in the Journal of Pain. This is actually a clinical practice guideline uh, about lumbar stenosis. Um, and um, this says here, non-surgical interventions for lumbar spinal stenosis leading to neurogenic claudication, a clinical practice guideline. Neuro neurogenic claudication is that um, burning discomfort that patients with spinal stenosis often have in their lower extremities when they're standing up or walking. But as Dr. Pack said, it can also manifest as a sense of weakness. Um, it's, I, I've heard patients describe it as almost like they're, they're running out of batteries. You know, they're, they're, their legs just won't take them any further. Often there's a sense of heaviness and tiredness. That is neurogenic claudication. And so this paper, um, uh, what, it, what it essentially is, is a study of studies. So they take all of the randomized control studies that are available uh, on various treatments, various non-operative treatments for spinal stenosis, and they try to summarize it in a way that informs us of, uh, um, about how to manage um, non-surgical uh, um, approaches to treatment here. Um, so on the next slide here, um, you know, uh, I use this uh, article as kind of a stepping off point because it's, it's um, very recent and it highlights some of the typical treatments that we offer patients uh, for spinal stenosis. Number one, in the upper left-hand corner there, you see something that's called a Williams flexion protocol. You will notice that the patient here is doing um, largely flexion-based uh, exercises um, and this is generally the approach that's taken for lumbar stenosis. As Dr. Pak uh, mentioned, our spines are not static things. They, they're the, um, you know, the, our bones, our discs, everything moves in the spine. And believe it or not, when you're sitting down and, and um, uh, flexing your spine, that, that central canal actually opens up slightly and it allows those nerves room to breathe. Whereas if you're standing up, the, the central canal actually closes, um, closes off a bit. So these, the, the general approach for exercise in spinal stenosis is to flex the spine, that is to bend forward and to open up the central canal a bit. Um, moving onward, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, right top there, you see um, acupuncture. Um, the the uh, overall guidelines um, or the overall recommendation that was set forth by the guidelines in this paper basically said that um, patients should um, uh, give acupuncture a try. Now, there are not endless amounts of randomized controlled trials that are available to us about acupuncture and lumbar stenosis. However, the, um, the few high quality randomized controlled trials that we have indicate that it may be of it may um, confer a modest benefit. So it's worth a try. Um, what I will say about acupuncture is that um, it is, um, it's a completely different medical model and there's all different types of acupuncture um, and um, uh, different acupuncturists take a very different approach. So it's difficult to study this um, scientifically, um, uh, but it can uh, provide some relief. <coughs> um, I will, going back to the exercise for a moment, I will say that exercise actually had some of the most robust recommendations from the guidelines. There is a um, there is a moderate amount of high quality data from a variety of randomized control trials to show that exercise helps with um, the pain of uh, spinal stenosis and neurogenic claudication. Um, if we go down to the lower left-hand corner there, um, 
uh, there are a variety of medications that can be used for spinal stenosis. Um, however, they're not the types of medications that you may initially think of. A lot of us, when, when we're feeling pain, reach for NSAIDs. These are our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Um, but the thing is, is that spinal stenosis, um, if you're not in the midst of a flare, is not really an inflammatory condition. It's actually a condition where there's some compression of the nerves, but there's also compression of the blood vessels that supply the nerves. And so um, a lot of our anti-inflammatory uh, medications don't necessarily have a great benefit. That comes with a caveat though, because we're discussing spinal stenosis kind of in isolation here, but as we all know, nothing ever happens in isolation. And very often our patients come to us and they are flared up. You know, they're, they've had on and off back pain and then something happens that kicks it off and they have a, a flare of pain. In that instance, sometimes anti-inflammatory medications uh, can be of help. But what this study found is that for those patients who are not flared up and have baseline steady um, discomfort when they walk, anti-inflammatory medications are not necessarily the best to take. Um, instead, it recommends the patient, that doctors actually reach for um, uh, medications that are sometimes used for conditions of mood and um, uh, uh, such as various almost antidepressant medications, believe it or not. Um, um, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the options that we have available to us um, are sometimes not the most obvious. Um, and uh, then we have actually, uh, we are able to do various injections for, um, for treatment of spinal stenosis. And I believe Dr. Pack, uh, um, perhaps you can comment on that. Sure. So uh, as Dr. Michio mentioned, we always, you know, we, we do try to take a multidisciplinary approach and offer the most conservative options to our patients. In addition to that, interventions, if patients are good candidates for it, may be offered. And one of those injections that Dr. Mitchell had mentioned that you can see here is, is, is called an epidural steroid injection. A lot of people will refer to these as cortisone injections. And I think that was also uh, mentioned in one of the, one of the posts. So um, I'm happy to address that. So basically in this area where there's really a tightness in the space, we can deliver a steroid medication. And oftentimes that can provide relief and um, you know, it doesn't really change the underlying processes and that there certainly is that stenosis there, but can oftentimes help with, with, uh, with the pain itself. So, you know, from our standpoint, you know, it is, it is one of the more common procedures that we do. You might hear about people doing this for, for example, sciatica. Um, it's about a 10 minute procedure. We, uh, there's nothing you have to do in preparation before, uh, there's very minimal or actually no recovery time period afterwards. And most people actually go to work and go on about their day. Um, but if you kind of think about the risks and benefits of this particular procedure, I would say pretty low risk and potentially very high reward. So this is oftentimes one of the first procedures we will offer our patients. Um, I think if we go to the next slide, Dr. Hartle. Yeah, and let me just uh, maybe mention that uh, it is certainly, you know, with the epidural injection, what I've seen over the years is it, it certainly helps. Sometimes because, however, because the lumbar stenosis itself is not gonna disappear, it also can, the symptoms can come back. And then you can say, well, why do, why, why do an epidural if the symptoms come back anyway? I think it depends on the severity of the symptoms, of course, and the severity of the lumbar spinal stenosis. But, but, but what this can also be helpful for is for diagnosis then, because if somebody has lumbar stenosis and they have an epidural, and you're not really sure if you should uh, consider an operation, the fact that that person gets better after lumbar stenosis, after an epidural injection, even if it's only transient, is confirmation that the lumbar stenosis is actually the problem. So therefore, lumbar epidural injections are actually incredibly helpful. And maybe, maybe that person is lucky and the, the symptoms don't come back. But if they come back, then you can tell them with greater certainty that, that a small operation may, may be the next step. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I think that goes with most of the procedures that we do, you know, we and talk about how patients react to these or how they do after these injections. And I will generally tell people, look, the, the intent is to give you treatment. 
because certainly every single thing that we do gives us a little bit more information about what the underlying pain generators are. And even if it doesn't give you, let's say, long-term relief, it does help someone like Dr. Hartle with decision-making when it comes to, let's say, interventions. So certainly, I think that's a great point. Um, the, the next thing that, that I wanted to kind of briefly touch upon is certainly when you've gone through the, the, the motions of doing the medications, the physical therapy, maybe you tried an injection, and those really haven't provided you with relief, then something that may be of an option to you is something called an inner spinous spacer. Now, I won't get into the details too much about um, all the nuances of this procedure, only to say that it's exactly what it looks like there in the picture. There's basically a small implantable device that's placed in between the vertebrae. And you can see that there's these little hinges that serve two purposes. First of all, to secure it in that particular area. And then also what it essentially does is it puts the patient in a position that relieves some of the stress off of the actual nerve root elements. And so, um, you know, in terms of candidacy, that's, that's something that you should have a discussion with in terms of with your surgeon or your pain management provider or any one of us, one of us in our team. Um, but there are certain potential advantages to doing this procedure, um, certainly minimally invasive and it's done through a very small, usually it's about a, an incision the size of a dime. Um, it's the same day procedure. We offer it under essentially a deep sedation. So not general anesthesia, but the type of sedation you would get for a colonoscopy. And it's a same day procedure. So very minimal recovery time. Patients will say that they feel sore for a few days afterwards. Also, it is reversible. <clears throat> so it's an implant that we place, but certainly, you know, it doesn't preclude surgery in the future. You can take it out. And what I will also say is that, um, you know, there's many patients who come back and, and say, well, look, I, the pain that I had with the spinal stenosis is gone, but I got, I have this kind of new nagging pain in the foot or in the legs. And oftentimes that's a result of just someone doing more activity that they're not used to doing. So I think regardless, as Dr. Michio pointed out, rehabilitation for strengthening, core strengthening is always a component of this. And so, um, but this isn't a perfect procedure from the standpoint, it doesn't target all elements of the lumbar stenosis. There are limitations to procedures like this, and it's certainly not for a patient with spinal instability, which is the reason why I say that this is certainly something that you, if you're entertaining, has to be discussed with a, uh, with a professional from uh, a center like ours before proceeding. Dr. Peck here, there are some questions about, and this is <clears throat> somewhat similar maybe, the decompression machines, you know, which are not, it's not a surgical intervention, but the idea is also to achieve decompression of the spine. Are you, do you guys, also Dr. Mitchell, do you guys ever use those in your patients? Any experience with that? I don't have extensive uh, experience with it. I'd be curious if Dr. Michio has. I don't prescribe it to my patients um, explicitly. Um, <clears throat> anecdotally, I've had some patients who have explored that on their own and had some symptomatic relief with it. Um, what I will say though, is it makes me quite wary because um, a lot of these decompression machines, they come in various forms. And sometimes I have um, uh, older patients telling me they're hanging from a bar uh, <laughs> um, and such. And I say, please don't, please don't do that. So you have to be careful with these things. You know, our first uh, job as physicians is to do no harm. And so um, you, we just have to make sure that the, uh, the treatments aren't causing more trouble than, than right. uh, they should be. Yeah, that's my impression as well. People ask me, uh, I think it's expensive. It's unproven. The literature, uh, from what I know, hasn't shown any really lasting benefit of these. Um, but that said, anecdotally, sometimes patients seem to benefit from this. There's a was another question about neuromodulation. Any thoughts about that? You know, if by neuromodulation, I think they're referring to maybe spinal cord stimulation. And, you know, it's... It is an option for certainly some patients. Um, of course, that is an implantable therapy. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with what that involves, it's essentially like a pacemaker for the spine that can oftentimes scramble pain signals. Now, you know, the underlying problem here, it's, it's a space issue, as we've kind of reiterated multiple times. And a spinal cord stimulation device does not mitigate that specifically, right? So, and, you know, some of these patients don't have pain as a component of their spinal stenosis. So, um, it is an option. I think it's not necessarily a first line therapy for us, though. And that is true. It's 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 not infrequent that patients really don't describe pain, but more like weakness, numbness, sleepiness in their legs. That gets worse when walking, and it can be tricky again sometimes to make that connection and make that diagnosis. Um, that is certainly true. 
So this is interesting. So the interspinous spaces, again, the idea being, being you put a little implant in, it lifts up the bone, it takes the pressure off the nerves. You can do it under local anesthesia, which is nice, especially in elderly patients. It's not as good of a decompression as you can get with, a, with an open operation, but it is certainly something that frequently can uh, provide enough pain relief for patients to be happy uh, while not paying the bigger price of having a bigger operation, right? And um, so let's, uh, and, and this is the idea, again, what these devices do, and Dr. Pack, you know better, but um, it basically puts you in... Uh, flexion and which opens up the smile canal right yeah and and one thing i will i want to mention is when people hear this they say oh my goodness like you're gonna you're altering the the alignment of the spine and, and you know uh again there's nuances in terms of who are good candidates for this procedure um what i will say is that we will always ask patients do you get relief with sitting and bending forward and if you get relief with that then that is usually a better prognostic indicator for how successful something like this is but again you know, if you are entertaining something like this, that certainly has to be a conversation that you have with, with your surgeon and also uh, some of our other specialists. Right. And th that's a procedure that uh, mainly the pain management doctors do in the spine center. And uh, so, you know, uh, Neil Meadows Group, Dr. Pack, and, and some of the others. And I've, I've sent patients to them for this procedure uh, if, if I felt that that particular operation was better for the patient than the alternatives. There's another procedure you guys do, the mild procedure. Can you walk us through that real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a little bit different. And, um, you know, all these things are offering different types of relief by different mechanisms. So, you know, there's a lot of components that contribute to spinal stenosis. We've talked about those. It can be bulging discs. You can have arthritis of the spine. In addition to that, there is this ligament that lines the back portion of the spine. That's highlighted there in the green. And think of this ligament, it's called the ligamentum flavum. The, the name isn't so important, but that ligament is, think of it like a callus. And over decades and decades of time, that callus gets thicker and thicker. And that also will contribute to that spinal stenosis. All, this, all these elements contribute to crowding of the space. What the mild procedure does is, is a little bit different. So this actually is not an implantable therapy. Um, very similar to the spacer that we talked about. It's done through essentially one or two one centimeter incisions. And we pass uh, a couple of instruments there to essentially just shave away the ligament. So conceptually that should make sense. If you have a thick ligament, then you should be able to hopefully shave away some of that ligament to then decompress that area of the canal. Uh, that achieves two things. It is supposed to thin that ligament out to create space and also allows that ligament to be a little bit more pliable so a little bit more flexible to allow relief for patients. And that's what you're seeing there in the, in the after picture. Um, you know, again, this I think offers a lot of the benefits that the VertiFlex offers. And here you're actually not leaving anything behind, right? There's no metal device that's in between the vertebrae. This is essentially a procedure that is just done through a couple small one centimeter incisions. Very similar to the VertiFlex, it's the same day procedure done under just local anesthesia. Minimal recovery time, most people will say afterwards they have some soreness in the back. Oftentimes we don't even prescribe pain medications afterwards. We just say, you know, a Tylenol and Motrin for many patients is enough. Right. Does not preclude surgery. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Howard, you were saying? No, no, I was saying. Um, does not preclude surgery. So certainly if, if you decide that uh, additional surgeries indicate, or if someone, if your surgeon says additional surgeries indicate in the future, uh, doesn't preclude that. And, uh, but again, you know, there are always limitations to these things. It's not for patients with any degree of spinal instability. Um, it does not target all elements of the stenosis. So it's a conversation again that you have and you have to be examined for. Well, great. Thanks for walking us through uh, this and some of the other procedures. So we, we talked about lumbar stenosis, about non-operative treatment, uh, injections, medication, physical therapy. We talked about some of the less invasive procedures that you guys do, the mild procedures, the interspinous spacer. Let's talk a little bit about the, the surgery that we do. As you know, we have uh, a number of spine surgeons, neurosurgical, but al also orthopedic spine surgeons here at the spine center. And obviously in some of these patients, some of the things that we talked about may not be enough to really treat the symptoms. Not every patient has to go through exactly the sequence of 
treatment options that we outlined, uh, but pretty much everybody will probably do physical therapy, maybe injections, plus minus any of the other inter interventions that we discussed. <clears throat> now, there are certain scenarios where you may skip some of those if patient, uh, and, and patients with red flags, patients who have really bad lumbar spinal stenosis. And this is a diagram on the left side that indicates, again, a patient with lumbar spinal stenosis, compression of the nerves. The worst case scenario is th these patients can have weakness, you know, foot drop, paralysis in, in, the, in their feet and their legs. Another red flag would be what we call a cauda syndrome. If patients develop bowel or bladder incontinence, that tells us that you know, physical therapy alone, uh, medication, epidural injections are probably not going to be helpful. As a matter of fact, sometimes you really want to take these patients to the operating room sooner than later to decompress the nerves because you, you're worried about permanent nerve damage. And that, that is one of the reasons why I would get involved as a spine surgeon or one of my colleagues. Another reason is obviously if patients didn't respond to the other, all, all the other treatment options. And then there are different options of treating this surgically. Traditionally, what we used to do in the operating room, the way I was trained when I was training in neurosurgery was, you know, all these operations are done uh, currently under general anesthesia, of course. Uh, it's a big incision in the back, and then you remove the bones in the back, and you basically open up the spinal canal and take the pressure off the nerves. It's a very successful operation. If done properly in the right patient, uh, the concern with open surgery is always that there's a little bit more blood loss, there's a higher risk for infection after the surgery, and the healing time is longer. That's why about 15, 20 years ago, we started operating through little tubes. So we try to do the same operation, but we minimize the opening. And I was seeing patients today, and I always have my little tube here. So this is a little tube that we use to, to operate through uh, with a microscope. So you magnify everything, but then instead of making a big incision, we make multiple small incisions and go down to each level and then under the microscope, remove a little bit of bone, take the pressure off the nerves and get a really nice decompression of the nerves on both sides, the right and the left side. There was one question before from, the, uh, from one of the uh, 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 audience, uh, how do you know, or how do you know, how do you pick the level? Sometimes patients have three or four level lumbar spinal stenosis, yeah, and sometimes that's difficult to really determine. You know, radiographically, there may be some levels that are more severely compressed, and those are the ones that will certainly treat. But sometimes you have a patient, as you can imagine, where the lumbar stenosis doesn't look so bad on the MRI scan, and then you got to make the decision. Every, every, every level that we decompress takes about 30, 45 minutes in the operating room. So you have to make a decision you know, in terms of risk, benefit, how long is the operation, should you treat the other level as well. And that's, that's usually done in conversation with the patient and sometimes the family, family as well. But this is really, I would say, one of the most common operations that I do these day, days. So that's the tubular lumbar, a tubular operation for lumbar decompression. Somebody asked about endoscopy. Endoscopy is a very exciting technology that's up and coming. Uh, some surgeons treat similar pathologies, similar problems with lumbar stenosis through the endoscope. Currently, uh, it is a time-consuming endeavor in my experience, uh, but I'm sure if you come back in five or 10 years, the technology will be such that a lot of what I'm doing now through the tube, maybe in 10 years, we'll be doing with the endoscope. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. These things, as you all know, are constantly evolving, which is the beauty of technology and, and being in surgery because it is exciting and things are constantly evolving and mostly for the, for the benefit of our patients, of course. Now, there's a patient here who had lumbar spinal stenosis here at L4-5. You can see that on the MRI scan by now. You're all experts in reading MRI scans and x-rays, of course. You can see there's severe nerve compression. This patient failed non-operative treatment. We did a tubular decompression. So this is a little tube. There's a plastic tube on the picture going through the skin, a small opening. And then we did a, what we call a tubular over the top decompression. And we got an MRI scan after surgery. You can see everything is very nicely decompressed. And these patients go home the same day. Uh, these are operations that are being done under general anesthesia still. You don't wanna do this under local anesthesia because patients move around and we're operating close to the nerves. Would not be good if 
patient starts moving when you're operating under the microscope. So we do this under general anesthesia, but for the most part, these patients go home the same day. If they're a little bit older and have other uh, issues, maybe they stay overnight. And this is again, the idea, instead of an open operation here, we do everything through the little tube. Infection risk is essentially zero. There's no blood loss and patients recover faster. Sometimes if patients have spinal instability, uh, we also have to do a fusion and, and patients don't like that. However, sometimes if you have a slippage instability, we, we can add screws in a cage. This is all done with minimal invasive surgery. Uh, the surgery may take about an hour longer or so and patients stay overnight typically. Uh, but this is something that we do very commonly now. And if, again, if, if, if you do the operation for the right reason and the right patient, for the most part, patients do really, really well. So we're getting towards the end, but I, I didn't want to leave you without talking a little bit about prevention, because obviously, and maybe we should have talked about this first, but the most important thing is obviously not even to get to the point where you have symptomatic lumbar spinal stenosis. I always tell my patients, exercise, 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 uh, not too much. If you exercise too much, you're going to get back pain. If you exercise too little, you're going to get back pain. You got to find the, the sweet spot, and that may differ from patient to patient. But what, what's your, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Pack, what, what, what is your advice to patients in, term of, in terms of maintenance, prevention, healthy lifestyle? What can we do to avoid even becoming a patient or becoming a patient who needs more invasive procedures? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing is that we have to examine what we do every day. I think that's very important. So, um, if we all take a step back and think about what we do every day, I think we will probably all find that we do a whole hell of a lot of sitting all day. That's true. Um, and I'm working yeah. on my, you remind me <laughs> right. of my posture. <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, I'm stating the obvious here, but we're not made to sit all day. Um, and so um, that uh, can have obvious detrimental effects on, um, on our health. Um, uh, and certainly on the health of our discs and the health of our nerves. Um, and as Dr. Hartle just mentioned here, there's a sweet spot though, right? Because human beings are also not meant to do uh, CrossFit uh, five hours a day either. Um, and uh, CrossFit keeps me gainfully employed. Um, so, you know, you can overdo it. So as this graph shows, uh, there's a sweet spot. And it's very hard to counsel patients about exactly what that sweet spot looks like. Um, but you know, generally what I do with my patients is I'm counseling on a reasonable, regular routine that they do. And all of us struggle with that, but it is often that reasonable uh, routine, often a core strengthening um, routine um, that is not geared at um, you know, pushing ourselves to the extreme, but that is based on making slow and steady progress um, that often can be beneficial. And, you know, there's actually, I don't know if anybody has ever heard of the seven minute scientific workout. This is a, a workout that was actually published in the Journal of um, uh, Sports Medicine and actually was featured in the New York Times. Um, something like that can be a great way to stay, uh, stay in shape while not spending um, your life doing it. Um, uh, often I recommend something like that to my patients. Um, what, what does that, uh, really, what is that in the seven minute scientific? Yeah. It's workout? called the seven minute scientific workout. Um, and it's a series of exercises, um, um, that are designed to hit all of the major muscles, uh, muscle groups of your body. And oh. you know, so that's, that's a general exercise routine. It's not necessarily tailored for those with lumbar stenosis. But um, I'm generally trying to get my patients to develop good exercise habits rather than having them get involved with the latest and greatest fad that uh, is so intense they end up hurting themselves. So, well, thanks, Dr. Dr. Pack. And any, any thoughts, prevention? You have the, yeah. the seven minute non scientific workout or <laughs> any other recommendation? Uh, you know, that's, no, what I I would, think... that's probably what I do when I come home. But yeah, I think that I think that would be great if we could all do that. I mean, <laughs> uh, I think it, I think what Dr. Michio mentioned is, is uh, very important, though. It's uh, it's the 
daily regimented routine that you have. And that's how you kind of stick with it. And, uh, you know, I, I frequently will send obviously patients to physical therapy, you know, physical therapy will work with you for, let's say two months for two, two sessions a week. Obviously I understand that a lot of our patients are, you know, they're, they're busy throughout the day, so they can't do that. Right. So, um, I think PT is great. You can learn the core stabilization exercises and the strengthening that's really needed to prevent this from being a chronic problem. But I think it's really on, on you as the patient also to continue trying to do that routine and implement it into your life. And, and look, it's difficult. I struggle with it myself, but I think if you're able to do it, um, on a routine basis, that really, in my opinion, in, from an outcome standpoint can, can help you. So you don't have to see us necessarily and get these procedures done. Right. And if, if I may add just one thing, you know, sure. uh, unfortunately, there is no magic exercise here. You know, there, there's no magic exercise that's going to prevent you from having lumbar stenosis um, and such. But um, we have to work with what we have. And we know that um, cardiovascular exercise, for instance, brings uh, blood flow to uh, various tissues in our body, brings oxygen with it, and it brings various... Um, uh, cytokines and molecular um, uh, um, compounds to, uh, to all areas of our body. Um, and uh, participating in exercise can just make sure that things don't stay stagnant and that we optimize what we are, what we are, the cards that we are given essentially. All right, great. So that's, you know, I think that makes sense. A lot of it is common sense. You know, exercise is better than no exercise, of course. And, um, and I think we'll, uh, we're, we're at the end. We've had 50 minutes of uh, high intensity conversation. I, I hope that everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. It was really interesting. Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much for making time, Dr. Pack. I also want to thank Roseanne from the neurosurgery group who really puts this together, Tatiana, Amanda, who's, who's uh, in the spine center day and night helping us and also now is taking care of the spine time webinars. Thank you, Amanda. Sue, who's always also helping us. Uh, so thank you for everybody. And uh, thanks you know, for watching. And hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks. I think in two weeks, we'll talk about genetics. Is that true? I think so. I think genetics and spine. And then in a few weeks after that, we'll talk about the work that we do in Tanzania, which I think is also interesting. So have a good evening, everybody. Go home, do your scientific seven minute workout, and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Right, good night. Roseanne everyone. posted it for everyone so you can check it on the chat. That's true. Yeah. And again, <laughs> we, we couldn't get through everybody's questions, but I really appreciate your comments and uh, we'll see you again in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye everybody.